Thank you, Miss Donna, and thank you, choir. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles for a few moments to Isaiah chapter number 30, Isaiah chapter 30, and I want to share with you today from this Old Testament a message that I believe is uh, what we need today. Now, let me give you just a little bit of background while you're looking for Isaiah uh, chapter number 30. As we look at this, Assyria, the Assyrians were planning on attacking Israel. Now, Hezekiah was king of Israel. Instead of turning to God, Judah turned to God. But instead of this tribe, the northern tribe, turning to God, then he turned for help from Egypt rather than turning to God. And you know, we think, how stupid could he be? Why would he turn to another country instead of turning to his God? But folks, think about it. Your life and my life, think about how many times instead of turning to God for help that we try everything else first, ourselves. You know, we'll look at things and think we can work with it, we can work it out. And, uh, but we can't. We need God's help. So then if we need God's help, and he knows that, why do we have to wait? That's what I'm going to talk to you. Why is it that we have to wait for God's help? So look with me, if you would, at Isaiah chapter 30. And I'm going to read one verse. But leave your Bibles open because we're going to look at some more verses that, that tie all this together uh, today. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 1. He says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to their sin. In other words, they were trusting in themselves or they were trusting someone else for their help rather than turning to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now for your living word that we can open together and we can just see what, what you have to say to us. Father, we just thank you for our Bibles. Thank you for this less, these lessons that we can learn. And we know that anytime you say, whoa, that it's a, it's a word of warning. So, so you have a, a word of warning for us today. So Father, as we look at King Hezekiah, and instead of him turning to you for help, that he turned and sought help from the Pharaoh of Egypt. Father, help us to turn to you. Lord, we know that when we have a need, when we're dealing with things in life, that, that we should bring those things to you right then. But Lord, we know in spite of Israel's mistakes and because of your love for them, that you spared Israel as a nation. She would suffer because of her mistakes. But ultimately, she would survive as a people and as a nation. Father, help us to look at this example that's before us today, that indeed we won't make the same mistakes that King Hezekiah made in his day, but we'll draw our strength from you. Father, we thank you for your love for us and your guidance through life, and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now flip, if you would, just a few pages to Isaiah chapter 35, verse number 10. And so this prophet Isaiah is looking into the future here today that God will bring the remnant of Israel back into the land, and that's going to happen one day. There'll be a thousand-year millennial reign upon this earth. But look what he says in Isaiah chapter 35, verse number 10. This is to members of God's family. Uh, with the return to Zion. He said, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and <clears throat> everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away from them. Here's the point. God had a plan for Israel. God had a plan for Israel and he wanted to work that plan. He wanted them to be obedient to him. And God has a plan for us today. God has got a plan for your life. If you're in this building today and you're not saved, if you've never received Christ, then God's plan for you is that you'll know him in a personal way. And he offered his son, Jesus Christ, uh, to redeem us. He 
paid our sin debt. So that's the first thing he wants with us. He wants us to come today and worship him, the true God, and have a personal relationship with him. But he also wants us now that we are, for those of us who are saved, when we're born into the family of God, he wants, he's got a plan, a purpose for your life and my life. Now, his timing is not always like ours, is it? You know, when we have a, we, we have limits on it. We want God to act right now on certain things, and, but God's timing is not, not that way. But he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Some people go through life and they never understand or realize what God's purpose is. It's because they don't read the Bible. It's in the Bible. God's got a purpose and a will for your life and just get into the book. And you might be reading verses you've read before and God spoke to you in a way that way and you read them now and God speaks to you in a different way showing you what his will for your life is. I'm a, I'm a standing testimony uh, to that. God will show us. Now, God's way is not man's way. These are not man-made things here. Now listen what Isaiah 55 says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You know, we may not always understand God's timing. We may not always understand how God is dealing in our life. But here's one thing. We just keep on trusting and keep on being thankful to him for what he is doing in our life. And so God's gospel is his way. You know, he's given us a gospel. He's given us a, a message here. And, you know, you always we hear oftentimes uh, the best is yet to come. You know, the best is yet to come. And that's what I feel for this church. And so today, as I prepared this message, I wanted something for all of us as we look forward with excitement about how God is going to use this church even in a higher plane than where we are now. God's going to take us to another step. I believe that with all my heart. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us inviting others to come. The last few weeks, we've had several people come to be a part of our church here, to be uh, in this, and we're all in this together. And God has placed this church here to reach people. So that's what we're here for. Now, back in verse number 18 of chapter 30, I want to give you a couple things to consider here. And that is the omniscience of God. In other words, God knows everything. And he says, for the Lord is a God of judgment. Now, we're not talking about a judgment here where, um, where he's uh, about God passing judgment on us. That's not what that word judgment means there. That means that he is a discerning God. In other words, the God that we serve, the God that you read about in your, in your holy book that you have in your hand, that God knows everything. There's nothing that he does not know. He knows all about your life. He knows the past. He knows the present. And he knows the future. And he knows what he wants to do in your life already. But we have to get to that point. We say, okay, God, what is it? Here it is. Whatever it might be, I want to be. I want to be a part of what you want me to do. So what he's doing here, he is judging rightly. He is discerning what we have for us. In Ecclesiastes verse, chapter 8, verse 5, the Bible said, A wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. So here it is. God knows what we need, and God knows when we need it. And on God's timetable, it'll be exact, the perfect time. God will work in our life to show us whatever it is. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. For your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. But now oftentimes we become impatient, do we not? We'll pray about something and God doesn't answer that evening or that night or, or the next day. So we kind of upset with God. Don't you care, God? And we start all these questions. Just be still and wait on God. Just read your Bible. Keep on praying and God will reveal things to you that he's never revealed to you before. So, if God loves me, and he does, and he wants the best for my life, then he wants to teach me patience as well as we wait on the way. Listen to what Andrew Murray had to say. He said, be assured that if God waits longer than you wish, it is only to make the blessing doubly precious. So God knows what we're going through. He knows the afflictions that you're going through today. He knows the troubles you're going through, the sorrows you're going through. He knows, he knows all this. He knows everything 
about us more than we even know about ourselves. Now, Exodus chapter 3, verse number 7. This is one of my favorite passages that you might want to write that down uh, for a reference later to read. Listen what it says. And the Lord said, and there's four things here. There's actually four components here that he's going to give us from this scripture passage. See if you can pick them out while I read through them. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters who were wicked and horrible to them. For I know their sorrows and I am come down to deliver them. In other words, he's going to redeem them. Four components there. He said, I've seen the affliction in that verse. He said, I've seen the affliction of my people. He knew exactly what was going on with his people. He said, I have heard their cry. He knew how they were crying out to him. I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them. God knows your troubles today. God knows everything that you're dealing with today, whatever it might be. Maybe just you know and God knows, but God knows the troubles that you're going through because God sees, he hears, he's omniscient, he knows everything. Now, here's the thing. He wants to help us. How about that? We got a God in heaven who's interested in all these things in our life. He sees our affliction. He sees the, the when we cry out to him in our home perhaps, or he knows the sorrow that we deal with with the loss of a, of a loved one or loss of a job or whatever it might be. He knows all those sorrows, or, or maybe at school we feel like we're not accepted at school like we ought to be, maybe rejected. He knows all that. And so Jesus Christ came down from heaven. He came down to heaven because he wants to deliver us. So there's two ways that we can grow through this. He matures us through our adversity. We're going to have the inflictions in life. He just told us. The Lord said, I have surely seen their inflictions. So, inflictions. so he sees these things in our life. And so Israel learn through, that, through their adversity and affliction. They learn. Folks, did you know most of the stuff that we really learn, the things that the times that we, uh, that we are closer to the Lord, sometimes we learn the most when we're in the deep water, when we're going through some afflictions, do we not? I think everyone in this building would agree with that statement because adversity can be the best teacher. When are we closer to God or feel closer to God than we do any other time? It is the time when we're going through difficulty. It's in time when we're facing surgery or, or trying to heal up from surgery or not certain we've got a diagnosis and we don't like what the doctor said and, and it's the unknown and we're not sure what's going to happen next. We draw closer to the Lord then than we do any other time, do we not? It seems like when things are just smooth sailing and everything's going okay, then you know we're getting by okay, but you let something happen God knows our afflictions, and, and it brings us closer to him. So adversity can be our best teacher. This is what this guy had to say. He says, contrary to what might be expected, I look back on the experiences of my life at a time that seemed especially painful with particular satisfaction indeed as I look back. I can say with complete truthfulness that this that everything that I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that was truly enhanced and enlightened, my experiences has been through affliction and not through happiness. And I'd say that guy is exactly right. That's when we draw closer. Many of you thinking right now of a time where you got a bad report perhaps from a doctor or, or you lost someone that you love so much. And, and so where do you turn to? You see, Israel, back in their day, they, they were facing a difficult time. The Assyrians, Assyrians, who were horrible people, were going to come and destroy them. You would have thought that Israel would run to God, their God. After all, he's the God that brought them out of Egypt. He's the God that's done all these things. You would think that they would go to him first. You know what they did? They went to this other power, Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt, asking for help from protection from the Assyrians. They didn't go to God. God said, woe be unto you. That's what he said in that first verse that we read a few moments ago. And that word woe there is not, not, a good, not a good word for them to hear in that day. Isaiah says, 48.10 says, I have refined thee, 
but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. So, as we learn to live this Christian life, as we walk through, we experience difficulties in life. Do we not? Everyone in this room, we've experienced difficulties of whatever it might be. And uh, so life is not comfortable sometimes. It's not easy sometimes. But we need to remember that we have a God in heaven who's trying to make us and mold us to mold us to become all he wants us to be and that God wants us to be like his son Jesus. That's what he's, that's what he's doing now for us. He wants to do that. Here's a little pro, poem. It says, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and not a word said she, but oh, the things I learned when sorrow walked with me. You know, the lessons we learn during adversity are lessons that we draw closer to God and learn even more to depend on Him more than we ever have before. But you know, as we read about the children of Israel, God's chosen people, they chose to do these things, to turn away from God. We see the mistakes they made. We often see the mistakes that other people around us make, maybe our children, our parents, or other people we work with. We see the mistakes they make. Surely to goodness we can learn from that, you know, we're to learn from our mistakes. We make mistakes. All of us do. And we learn from those mistakes. If we don't, we're fools, the Bible says. So we learn from the mistakes of others and the mistakes that we make, and we're to grow as, and allow God to, to mature us. You know, no one wants to experience trouble. None of us want to do that. We don't want to go through a, a difficult time. And much of what we learn about God and life Happened, though, during a time of trouble, during a time, he says there, of affliction. Psalm 27 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. And what will he do? He will strengthen thy heart. How many times have we had to do that? You know, we I've sat with people at the hospital when I worked there. And, and they they were, loved one was back in CCU perhaps. And, and they were just devastated. Felt like they had nowhere to turn, you know, and. And many of them, I praise God, many of them knew where to turn to. And the only place they had to turn to for help and, and comfort, even in a difficult time, is to God in heaven. He knows everything that you and I are dealing with today. He knew everything that Israel was dealing with in that day. And he wanted them to come to him, to him seeking advice and guidance from them. Listen to what Job says. Job says, for his eyes are upon the ways of man. And he sees all of his goings. So, you know, we're limited in time and space. We're limited in all that. So we just walk by faith. We just trust God. Do we have to have a reason for everything? No. And you know what? Even if we had an explanation of a lot of things, that wouldn't change the hurt, would it? It would still be there. The passing of a loved one, if we knew why our son died or our spouse died or our parents, if we knew the answer to these, we would still have the hurt because they're no longer here. So you see, we're limited in time. We're limited on what we understand in this life. Now look down at verse number 21 of Isaiah 30 because here's what he promises to us, that he will direct our paths. Aren't you grateful for that, that we have a God who's willing to direct us every day of our life? He's given us a book here. He's given us instruction. The Bible said, the Lord said, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the left hand and when you turn to the right hand, we're to walk in the ways. So, if you know God's direction for your life, you can do that. You know, that's for people who are saved. He's right there with us. He never needed us. You know, God never intended for people to walk in the dark. That was never his intentions. His intentions is for you and I to know him as Lord and Savior of our life. That's his intentions uh, for us. And, and he wants to instruct us and guide us as we go every day of our life. Listen to what Psalm 32 says. I will instruct thee and I'll teach thee in the way that you should go. I will guide you with mine eyes. So God has promised to deliver us just as he would deliver to Israel from the Syrian. God has promised because he hears our cry. Have you cried out to him lately about something? Maybe 
I got a phone call from a loved one in another state or someone that you're dear, dear to and, and bad news perhaps, you know, and, and you just cry out to God. Israel needed deliverance. And this was his promise right here. He said, for the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. They shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. Israel needed, they needed worse than anything, deliverance from her enemies. She needed deliverance, but she had a rebellious attitude there from her wayward direction. Maybe our attitude's bad sometimes. Maybe God needs to deliver us from that. So Israel was on the path of sin. God was not on their heart. Is God on your heart every day? Do you think about God and how good he's been to you? So he tells us there in verse number one of chapter 30, he said, woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord. So Israel needed a heart transplant. That's what they needed. They needed they needed a change. They needed a heart transplant. So he saw their afflictions. We talked about that. He heard their cry that's lifted up. He, he wanted them to know the will that he had for them in their life. And now he tells us right here uh, that he came to deliver us. A time of rejection. They rejected him. And he's going to give them a new path to walk in. What is that? For us today, Jesus says, I'm the way. Are you following the Lord today? He's the way. Or are you on your own path? Are you just kind of going through life and, and choose to make your own decisions? Israel was on the path of deception. Folks, there are so many today who are on the wrong road today. They're on the path of deception today. And many people that you and I know that work with are walking in the wrong direction. Jesus said, this is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left hand. You know, for some reason, it's so easy for those of us who are saved, who are born again, uh, to venture off in the wrong direction sometimes. We think we're going the right way because this was our decision, but we find out it's not the path that God has for us. It's the path of, I'll do it my way. We want to do things our way, don't we? That's who we are. It's the path of, I'll do it when I want to do it. You know, when it's convenient for me, then I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. And then I'm going to do it the way that I want to do it. This is what we tell God. We don't tell him verbally, but by the actions of the way we live our life, we'll tell him, God, you know, I don't need you on this one. I'll take care of this my own way, and I'll do it whenever I want to, and I'll do it the way I want to. And uh, God, I can do without you. I can handle this myself. Can you see why God gave Israel the bread of affliction there and the, and the water of, diser the, of uh, diversity? Because they just choose their own way. You know, that's a choice we have. You and I can do that. We can go through life and we can never receive Christ. We can go through and never make that profession of faith, putting our trust in him. But what Jesus says, he says, this is the path. This is the walkway I have for you in life. Walk you in that path. And when we do that, he'll bless our life as we go along the way. Adversity comes, sure, it'll make us stronger when it comes. Difficulties come sometimes as we go through, sure. All those things happen. But they're created to mold us, to make us, look what Jesus went through, to make us strong in life that we'll be, be a better witness for him, that we'll, that we'll be unashamed of the gospel, whether we're at school or wherever we are, to share the gospel message with others who need to hear it. That's how God is going to bless this church in the days ahead, when we just totally walk with him, walk that path that he set before us. What is that path? Reach people for Jesus Christ. Show them we have a place that we love them. God loves them. We love them. We want to grow with them. We want to uh, watch them as they mature and grow closer to the Lord. As a byproduct, God's going to do, God's going to add to his church. He's the one that does the adding. But we have our part to do as well. Let's bow our heads together for a few moments. You know, God knows everything. He knows exactly what you need in your life. 
You need him. You need him more than you need your next breath. You need Jesus. Now, if you already know Jesus, he knows that you need him as well. You need him as you grow in life because he knows your afflictions. He knows how to help us. God sees everything. And you know what? He has promised. He's promised to direct us. He's promised to, to deliver us a lot of things that, that he keeps us from in life that we're protected from. And he wants to direct our path. You know, we may experience affliction and adversity in life. We all do that. But you know what? In that time of waiting, it allows God to teach us some things, some things that will mature us and grow us so that we'll be more like Jesus. So let me ask you today, do you know him today as your Lord and Savior? Has there been a time that you've asked for forgiveness of sin and asked Christ to come into your heart? You see, you make a lot of decisions in life, a lot of choices in life, but that one is eternal. That's what he wants you to do. That's his plan for you, that you may be born into his family, born into the kingdom of God. Why don't you do that today? Why don't you say yes to him? Lord, I, I know I need you. Lord, I, I want you. Please forgive me and come into my heart. If you ask him to do that, he'll do it. Then he always called us openly and publicly. We make our decisions openly and publicly. Never be ashamed to take a stand for him. Maybe that's what you need to do today. Maybe, maybe you've made that decision. You've never followed through. You've never come through baptism and baptismal waters. You need to get that settled. You'll never have the assurance until you get that settled in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're looking for a church home and you feel this is where God wants you to be a part of a, of a, of a local church. I invite you today on behalf of this church to be a part of Poplar Grove, a church that loves the Lord, a church that's excited about the days ahead and the possibilities that can happen in this place. So, Father, I pray for these moments of invitation that whatever that need will be, that that need will be met today in this place. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to have a moment of invitation. If God has laid on your heart today a decision, perhaps one of those things that I've talked about, or maybe maybe you just want to come for a word of prayer. This We're still in a brand new year. We've just started. What greater way than to start and say, Lord, I want you to direct my path this year. Because that's what we're praying for for our church. Because God's got great things for us, just as he has great things for you as well. He's got a plan and a purpose. But we must be obedient to that. Let's stand together if you would. I'll be here at the front. If you have a decision, you come on this first verse. You come. decision today that you need to make that would that would bring honor and glory to God. First of all, do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Has there been that time? If there's not, you need to get that settled today. You say, well, I don't know what I would say if I come forward. You don't have to say anything just by your coming. I would say to you, do you come? Do you know Jesus? And if you say, I want Jesus, then I'd lead you in a little prayer. 
It's you inviting Christ to come in your heart. The prayer is not what saved you. It's you inviting Christ into your heart. You see, it's so simple. The greatest decision a person makes in life. Maybe other decisions. It's maybe you've been saved and you've never followed believer's baptism. You're saved when you invite Christ in. But believer's baptism is your testimony that you're identifying with the burial, death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to come for baptism. Or maybe church membership. You're looking for a church home and you want a home that preaches the gospel and you feel this is where God wants you. You see, he's directing your life. You're not here by accident by divine design today. One more verse. Maybe this verse is just for you. Young person, perhaps. Mom, dad. thank you for this time together today. Thank you for this time of worship. And we've come to this place, Father, to worship and to praise you. Now, Father, as we leave this building, we ask that you go with us. And Father, may we live that godly life out in this community that others would see our life and they would want what we have, and that is that relationship with you. Thank you for everyone who's gathered in this building. And Father, I pray that you'll bless us as we go. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Prouder than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious.